How do you find the time to do all the things you and Chris do? You must not watch a lot of TV. So what made you change from plant-based to completely vegan? How do you justify feed costs when, they're, when they are mostly pets? We recently decided we are no longer comfortable processing our animals for meat. I don't want to get rid of them, but having a hard time with the numbers. Hey friends, it's Jen at the Sunshine Farm and today I'm going to be doing a Q&A from some questions that people asked us. I asked people to submit questions on Facebook, Instagram, and on YouTube. So I'm just going to go through them one by one and answer them for you guys. Answer, answer them for you guys. Okay. Okay, so the first question is from Allison. She asks, how much land do you have to have to start? And she says they're still in the planning stages. And on top of that asks, is it less because it's plant and not animal based? So I would say you absolutely do not need as much space if you're doing plant based homesteading and just focusing on gardening. You can even do it on like a quarter of an acre because you can grow so much food, more food per acre with plants than you can per animals. So yes, you definitely need a lot less land to start. You can start in a backyard, in a small backyard, you can start on a patio. When it comes to gardening, you can really start anywhere. Um, I definitely think that if you don't have space right now, community gardening is a great way to get a head start with gardening. Yeah, it depends on how much you wanna grow of your own food. If you really wanna grow all of your own food, I think probably for two people, maybe like four to 6,000 square feet gardening um, would feed you almost all of what you need. And then for space for an orchard can be anywhere from like a small little plot where you plant a few fruit trees to a half acre to an acre to more than that. Just depends on how much you need. Really for a small family, you don't need that much room to be a plant setter and to be more sustainable and self-sufficient with your food needs. I think a great size for someone who wants to homestead and wants to have a lot of different options when it comes to plants is like anywhere from like one to five acres is like manageable. Once you get above five acres, it becomes a lot more difficult to manage and you have to have more equipment. Like for us, we have 12 and a half acres and it becomes a lot of work, especially in the summer when we have crazy growth and we have to keep it down. And so we did just recently purchase an old tractor and a brush hog so that we can keep our pastures nice and lush and keep the weeds from overpowering the grasses. Sorry, the cats are fighting. One second. Oh, she's like impossible to catch. Say hello. Say hello. Uh, come on. Okay, back to q and I don't know where it was at, but I'm pretty sure I finished that question. Brendalyn asks, do you plan to keep it as a hobby-based farm in the future? Would you like to transition to a full-time homestead? Right now, we call it a hobby farm because we're not earning an income off of the farm itself, but I'm actually hoping to transition our farm into a nonprofit where we have a farm sanctuary with rescued farm animals and also educational gardens and orchards so that we can show people that um, there's a way to live healthy, full lives through gardening and growing your own food and, and producing food in um, food forests and nut trees and all of those amazing things instead of supporting like animal-based agriculture, especially since so many people are supporting factory farming without realizing it. So just showing people that if they resonate with animals the way that, that Chris and I do, and if that's on their heart, there's another option, another way to live and giving them some resources on how to tap into that. So the other side of that question is, would we like to transition to a full-time homestead? I'm not sure exactly what this question means. Maybe she's asking if we would like to like make enough money from our homestead to be able to not work anymore. And I just don't see that as a possibility with the taxes in New York being so high and our mortgage being so high. I don't really see us being able to produce enough income off of our land in the near future and I don't really want my life to be so consumed by having to do like the outside and gardening and constantly growing food. That's not something I really, I really don't see myself being a farmer, like a farmer that makes money off of farming. Um, but I certainly would love to have a nonprofit and I, I would love to be here full time and work virtually or work as a consultant and not be in an office 24 seven. Well not 24 seven, but eight to five. Yeah, uh, so end of question, I would love to be here full time, but 
not necessarily earning an income in the traditional ways you would think of from a homesteader. Um, okay, what are your 2020 garden plans? Oh, sorry. What of your 2020 garden plans are you most excited about? Um, I think I'm excited to see how things perform in the second year of our no-till garden. So last year we started no-till by laying down different compost matter and different um, organic matter. So we had like a bed that was a roost out bed, which is rotted hay that came from our goat pen. We had a back to Eden bed, which is some um, composting wood chips. And then we had a bed that was more like no dig. And we also have like a 30 by 50 plot that we're transitioning into no till that previously was tilled. So I'm excited to see how that performs in the second year because oftentimes with no-till the first year does pretty poor. We had a lot of great success, but I imagine it's going to be a lot better in the future. So I'm excited to see how it transforms. I'm also really hopeful that a lot of our fruit trees survive their first winter. So I'm excited to see which ones come to life and how much better they do this year. So we did plant our orchard last year and we are actually going to be getting a lot of new trees and shrubs in the spring from a company out in washington that reached out and offered to send us a bunch of stuff so i'm really looking forward to that um so those are the things i'm most excited about and brenda lynn always asks what's your favorite dessert so lately we've been making a lot of like raw um desserts so basically what that means is you're not really cooking them and you're just like refrigerating them or freezing them. So one of my favorite things to make is pumpkin tarts. And we have so much pumpkin right now from the garden from last year. So it's like the crust is like dates and walnuts and coconut. And then the filling is like pumpkin and coconut milk and cashews and so good. I just love things that are like creamy and like nutty and um, really filling. Okay, so Mary asks, how did your recent visit to Farm Sanctuary inspire y'all? So we went to Farm Sanctuary, which is uh, like a 200 acre farm down in Watkins Glen, New York, where they have rescued farm animals. It really showed me that I don't wanna just have a sanctuary with a goal of rescuing all the animals possible. The goal has to be bigger than that because you're never gonna be able to supply a home to all the animals that need homes because far factory farming and animal abuse in the agriculture industry is so bad and there's so many animals that are in bad situations that need homes. So instead there has to be a bigger focus you're working on. And so here in our farm, I wanna educate people about like plant-based food options and ways they can grow their plant-based food because that's gonna be make a bigger impact than necessarily rescuing like a single cow that came from like the dairy industry or something like that. It's just like, how can I make a, how can we make a bigger impact and affect animals in a more positive way? And I think like talking about like advocacy around like f ending factory farming and you know, the rights of animals to live healthy lives and things like that is gonna go longer. And I see Farm Sanctuary doing that a lot. So it was encouraging in that way. Another, so Katie asks, how do you find the time to do all the things you and Chris do? You must not watch a lot of TV. So that's a really good question and we get that a lot like how do you have time you might you guys must your lives must be crazy you know all of those things and i think actually in the winter we have a lot of downtime which might sound surprising but the animals don't actually need they're not a huge time commitment which sounds ridiculous and it sounds like we're just like not taking care of them but really like they just need food they need water you know you want to make sure they're doing okay they're not facing any health issues they need shelter, you know, shavings, but a lot of it just takes like maybe like an hour a day. We don't have an insane number of animals. So it's not a huge time commitment there. And actually Chris does a lot of that. So we do delegate pretty well. I do a lot of the like preserving and cooking and gardening and like preparing to garden and starting seeds and all of that side of things. And he does a lot of like the animal husbandry. But then of course we both do things together. Like if there's an injury we need to treat or like we do the, the goat's hooves, we do the goat's hooves together. Like we take care of like, like TJ had an injury the other day, our full size horse, and we had to treat that together. So there's lots of things we do together, but he for the most part takes care of the animals and I for the most part do like the, the homesteading with the gardening stuff. 
Um, so actually we do actually watch like a fair amount of TV and that's not something I'm super proud of. I would like to watch less TV, but I just like want to sit down on the couch and watch TV. So we'll watch like a lot of YouTube videos and um, we watch, we like like sitcoms, like we love The Office, we love Parks and Rec. Uh, right now we're watching New Girl. Um, we, we, we recently finished watching, oh, Schitt's Creek and that was really good. And I also have a guilty pleasure watching The Bachelor. So, sorry, don't judge me. I mean, you can judge me, I don't care. Um, Courtney, she asks, well, she asks jokingly, what do you do with the eggs? And this is actually a good question because uh, we recently, or I recently stopped eating eggs. Chris still is like occasionally eating eggs and that's up to him. It's not something I'm going to um, decide for him. But I recently chose to stop eating eggs and to move towards like a fully vegan diet. Technically, like the eggs, we take the eggs out of the chicken coops for their benefit because they'll just rot in there or they just don't do anything in there. They'll freeze and crack and break or whatever in the coop. So we'll take them away and then we'll feed them back to the chickens or we'll do, you know. So before I was eating them, we were both eating them and now I just decided that in the future we wanna rescue, we only wanna rescue hens. And it just didn't make sense. It didn't feel like something I wanted to do anymore. I didn't wanna like reinforce the idea that chickens are here to produce eggs because really like the eggs were just kind of like happened to come we don't have chickens for eggs we don't enjoy our chickens because of their eggs and we really appreciate like their the value of their their lives apart from what they provide us with so it just made sense for me to stop and on instagram somebody asked recommended the recommendations for good seeds and um, my favorite seed companies are the ones that are local to you. So it's kind of a confusing answer, but it frustrates me when everyone is like buying seeds from like states that are like super far away and they have no knowledge of companies that are nearby. And sometimes you have to because sometimes there aren't like good heirloom organic companies near you and you're trying to find like a certain variety. But I think overall looking at regionally adapted seeds that are like heavily heirlooms and also um, organic companies is something I really value and would recommend. I would say if you don't know where to buy seeds and you're looking for places to spend your money, spending it in your own community is really awesome. We have a seed company like an hour from us called Fruition Seeds. She, the owner, Petra, and her partner, they're amazing. They, they're so knowledgeable. I visit their farm on a regular basis. I've been there like a handful of times. She's actually visited our farm before and I just, I love their seeds. But if you're in California, I'm not gonna tell you to be buying fruition seeds. And I think Petra, the, you know, one of the owners of fruition seeds would totally agree with that, that regionally adapted and local is really important because those seeds are gonna be adapted to your climate already and you're gonna have a better start at growing them well best plant steading resources. I'm guessing she's like looking for resources around like homesteading, like as like a plant-based person or vegetarian or vegan, someone who's like focusing on like growing plants and growing food from a garden instead of from animals. And I would say the best resources I've tapped into are just like really skilled gardeners and using their resources to help me learn how to garden. There aren't a lot of people talking about vegan or plant-based homesteading particularly trying to think of some resources that I've used. I've definitely tapped into local seed companies and the resources that they offer. So like I look at fruition seeds a lot. Anybody who's a skilled gardener, people in the permaculture world know a lot about food in gardens and in food forests and orchards and all of that. So like permaculture folks and um, gar organic gardening folks and like the no-till the no tail circle of people is really great too. And biggest gardening lessons. I would say that I think I don't like to let the garden control me. I like to let the garden be a reflection of me. And so I'm a little bit chaotic. I'm a little bit spontaneous, a little bit messy. So my garden is that way too. And I think if I like try to force it to be like neat and organized and like everything was in perfect rows and 
Um, I always planted the same thing, the perfect amount of things. It would stress me out because it's not who I am. So I think just like learning to embrace that the garden can just be a reflection of me. And then in that, like that's where I wanna be. That's where I wanna spend my time. And it feels like a lot easier to, to be a gardener. And I think allowing yourself to adjust your expectations and plans based upon what your life looks like. Um, you know, this summer I might be really busy with my school work. And so I'm not gonna have the same amount of time to dedicate to the garden. So I'm gonna scale back quite a bit and just focus on plants that are low maintenance. So a lot less tomatoes, a lot less peppers probably. Charlie asks, what jobs do you guys have besides farming? So farming really isn't like a job for us. It's more of our lifestyle. So apart from being on a homestead, I work full time at our university, our a local university in the disability field. And Chris, he's an energy engineer. He works specifically with like heating and cooling systems. And I also am a grad student, so I take classes in the evenings and i'm in my fourth year of my grad grad program so i'll have like a couple years left because it's a phd program so it takes like a long time where do you find the time for farming i mentioned this earlier it's just the time i think most people don't realize how much idle time that they have how much free time they really have a lot of people are spending a lot of time on screens um, watching tv and maybe a lot more social time and we don't do that as much. We don't have as much time to hang out with friends or get together with people. We're spending our evenings, we're spending our weekends doing projects around the farm. And so that's just something that we've decided. And in the past, on the weekends, we'd be really bored and we try to find things to do and they typically involve spending money. So it's really nice because in the farm, there's always something we can do and we keep ourselves busy. Rebecca asks, what made you guys decide on New York for your farm? It wasn't really as much of a decision as a like we were already in New York and I was in grad school I am in grad school but at the time I was just starting grad school at the time I you know we were both working full-time here and we wanted to live on a horse farm and I wanted to have a horse and so it just it just that was the option there was no option to move if we moved we wouldn't have had any money to be able to do this and then Kev Rose farm asks Advice before buying horses. I rode for 12 years and owned before, but not at my own house. I think, well, first of all, typically in like riding stables, riding barns, horses aren't necessarily kept in like the most ideal conditions. So personally, I believe that horses should have a lot of space, a lot more space than most like riding stables offer them. So I think that they should have like almost like 24 seven access to pasture. And I think that's like, people would really disagree with me on that, but it, it's just, it's this big animal that in their like natural habitat would be like roaming, um, grazing and, and spending a lot of time walking around. And so when you tend to keep them in stalls, they really just don't have a lot of time to, to explore, to walk, to move their legs, to move their muscles, to stay active, to stay fit. So I would say finding somebody local to you who keeps horses on pasture and learning from them and just having mentors in your area and also not to be too overwhelmed because you'll learn as you go and as long as you have the right resources to tap into in the case of like emergency you'll be you'll be okay Tommy asks what's the hardest part of homesteading as a couple I would say for us it's been like managing stress and managing finances on a good day it's not hard, it's fun. We get to snuggle the animals and we get a lot done and we feel great. But when there's like stressful situations, I'm not the best at handling stressful situations. I get really upset easily. So that's hard. And then the other thing is choosing like where to spend your finances and always making sure you have like enough backup in case something does go wrong because there's so many potential expenses that could add up that you might not anticipate. And then Sydney asks, do you have any tips for beginning gardening on a tight budget? How would you prepare a new spot of land in January so you can begin planting, planting in April? So for a tight budget, I think no-till and using like permaculture is perfect because you're improving the soil itself, so you're going to have less of a need to bring in soil. 
So I think no-till permaculture methods are really low cost. They just take time to establish. And for preparing a new spot of land, what we do is we put down cardboard or another type of barrier, like um, we've used like contractor paper before, like newspaper, cardboard, and then you put down like just different organic matter that you want to garden with. So some people use composted wood chips. You just want to pick something that's like already composting or has a short composting phase that it's feeding the soil quicker. So you can use like um, rotting hay, rotting straw, just make sure it's not sprayed with any pesticides. You can use grass clippings, you can use leaves, you can use compost if you have access to compost. You can use um, like, like mushrooms, compost is a really great option. And oftentimes you can get some of these things for free. You can get access to wood chips for free a lot of times. Yeah, lots of free materials that are available. Ni Nigella, nap time Nigella asks, what are your five must grow vegetables now that you have a completely plant-based diet? Um, let's see, five must grow vegetables. Hmm, that's a tough question. I would say onions, garlic, potatoes. I love all of those things. Onions, garlic, potatoes, maybe beets or like other root vegetables and peppers for all the yummy seasonings you can make with peppers. So I also love squash. I don't know, the five is hard. Five is hard to limit myself to, but garlic and onions we use all the time. They're so good for your gut, so much flavor. Potatoes are so filling. It's a great substitute for what you might be used to with like a meat. Root vegetables are so hearty, so filling, and you can use them a million different ways. Um, Natasha asks if we've tried growing elderberries yet. I did cut some cuttings. I took some cuttings from an elderberry bush that's growing wild down our street and I started them in the summer and then I planted them in our garden in the fall, like our little tree nursery in the garden. So I'll see if they're alive and I'll move them if they're not. Um, but I'll, if, if I don't have success with those, I'll pick up some starts from a nursery. They do really well here. They actually grow wild in um, upstate New York, but there's no wild ones on our property. Caitlin asks, what made you change from plant-based to completely vegan? Do you feed the eggs back to the chickens? I mentioned this earlier, just like a desire to, to avoid reinforcing um, the idea that chickens are for eggs. And I just didn't really need them in my diet. I didn't feel like they were healthy for me. Donna asks, how long have you been plant-based? Well, we like stopped eating meat and dairy back in 2016. 2016 so it's been like almost four years and now like the eggs and the dairy the eggs and the honey like a few months um, but plant-based you can eat some eggs and some honey if you're plant-based it's not like a perfect like follow a uh, rule book of you have to be like a hundred percent this way which I really like about the plant-based label it's like more open to people moving towards like more plant-based food without having to feel like they're like a hundred percent vegan and Donna also asks, how do you justify feed costs when, they're, when they are mostly pets? We recently decided we are no longer comfortable processing our animals for meat. I don't want to get rid of them, but having a hard time with the numbers. So it's a tough question because, of course, finances is like unique to every situation. I think that the animals were brought into this world and that now that they're here, I think that it's respecting their lives and their like innate value by providing them with the nutrients that they need to survive and live and thrive. And I, I love that you're, you know, choosing not to, um, to take their lives anymore and instead want to just care for them. Um, there are definitely ways to cut on feed costs. There are ways to supplement by growing food for your animals. We grow like all of our, pretty much all of our greens for our rabbits in our garden. Eventually we'd love to to bale some of our pastures for hay. Right now we're not. Yeah, it's like I think of it as like I could spend money on clothes or I could spend money on things I don't need. Um, and technically like I don't need to have animals, but they bring me a lot of joy. I get to provide them with a safe home. And so it's like almost like, of course I'm gonna spend money on, on them and like their needs because 
I just won't spend money on the other things that I don't need. So we make a lot of compromises, like I don't really buy new clothes. I pretty much either get gifted things or I shop like used at thrift, sh thrift stores. So it's just like choosing to spend money on like the animals because they deserve it instead of things that I don't need. Acknowledging that the animals are brought into this world, they deserve to be cared for. At the end of the day though, I don't like recommend people necessarily have to have animals on a homestead. How do you manage running a homestead while working a full-time job? Do you still have time for yourself, for your hobbies, and to run errands, clean the house? I talked about this earlier, so this comes up a lot, but I think when you care about something, you like find the time. There are times where a house isn't as clean as it could be where other people might have like pristine houses, but I don't care that much about having like a perfectly clean house all the time. I'd rather have gardens and take care of animals, and so it's it's kind of like just like choosing your priorities like if you want like a perfectly pristine house you're probably not going to want to live on a farm like a lot of what i do here is my hobby so um, but lately i've been exercising a lot more taking walks going on jogs so that's becoming a hobby i love to write music and to sing and play guitar and so i kind of just like fit that in sometimes and yeah it works um hideaway homestead asks what plants give you the most protein um Protein is in so many plants. So there's this like common misconception that if you're like vegan or vegetarian, you're not getting enough protein. But I think it's like important to remember that like animals all get their protein from plants. So plants have a lot of protein. Um, chickens and cows and goats and bunnies and all those animals, they're getting their protein from plants. Like we can get our protein from plants too. And so like things like beans and grains and potatoes and greens and um, quinoa and legumes, I already said beans, nuts, seeds, all those things. There's like so much protein in plants. It's really, it's typically what they'll say is if you're, if you're vegan, the only way you're really going to be protein deficient is if you're not getting enough calories. And so if you're getting enough calories, you're going to have enough protein. Leah asks, what made you decide to move and live the farm life? what is the most beneficial part when it comes to your own life personally? Well, I was like dealing with some health issues for a couple years and I'd always dreamed of having a horse. So my, my goals have shifted a lot since then. And so moving to like and living the farm life, it started with like one goal and then it shifted along the way. And there were like a few different influences at, at, at the time that made me want to garden and have an orchard. and. It's just kind of one of those things that once you kind of get your toes wet, like I just like fell in. I didn't know I was looking for homesteading or farm life. I didn't know that's what I was looking for. It just kind of kind of like fell in, I guess. It was almost like a beautiful beautiful accident. The most beneficial part is like the constant adventure. I'm a very I'm a very adventurous person and I get bored extremely easily. But living on a farm, there's just always surprises and adventures and things you can like jump into like whether it's like remodeling something on our barn or um, a new garden bed or like a new project or like simply just going outside and having the animals just be really cute and loving or starting seeds it's like there's constantly stuff to do or to think about doing yep that's it if you have any more questions put them down in the comments below and i'll try my best to answer them thank you for being here if you're not already a part of the um plant stetter family go ahead and subscribe i am so grateful for these questions thank you all for asking me and giving me something to answer and i'll talk to you guys later